thought I'd start off by putting the team up here. These are the active team members. Um, and on the right are people who have been involved in the project in the past. So uh, Hyper is, um, and here's an outline of the talk. So um, Hyper is a linear solver package for uh, sparse linear systems. Uh, and in particular, we focus on multi-good methods for solving these systems. So I'll say a little more ab about that in particular. In particular, but um, it's 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 uh, different from like Trulinos and Petsy in that way that we're very focused on the linear system solves, and, and we're not a broad mathematical uh, li pack package or library. Okay, so I'll give a quick introduction. Um, I'll give a little background motivation, say something about these linear system interfaces, and then I'll cover the, the main part of the talk. will be covering two of these interfaces in particular, and you'll you'll see what I mean, what they are in in a second. Then I'll, I'll touch on the, some of the solvers and preconditioners that are in the package at the, at the end, as well as some additional information, and give a short introduction to the hands-on session that's going to happen later. Okay, so first some motivation. So uh, why multigrid? Um, the reason is because these are O of n uh, methods, so if they work the way they're supposed to. So if you have n unknowns you're solving for, they take O of n work to solve for it, which means they have a good potential to really scale up to large uh, sizes and, and lots of processors. This is a little cartoon that kind of illustrates this. So this is a weak scaling plot where you're growing the problem size and the number of processors in tandem. And you see one of these lines gets, uh, takes more, you take more and more time to solve these larger systems even though you're throwing additional processors at it. And with a multi-grid method you have the opportunity of taking constant time um, and basically utilizing those extra resources very well. So this is why we developed them. Um, they're not black box methods, though. Uh, they often apply to smaller classes of problems because they take into account additional uh, things about the, the, the underlying physics or the underlying nature of the problem. And this is how they achieve the O of N um, uh, to begin with. So here's also here's a cartoon that will just kind of run you through what a multi-grid method is and what the main components are. So here, we're, I, we're thinking of a 2D problem, uh, just a simple Laplacian problem. So here, I'm plotting uh, the initial error. This is an iterative method. You start off with an initial guess, which means you, there's some error in, in, in the difference between that guess and the exact solution. It might look something like this when you plot it to begin with. And one of the main components of a multigrid method is a smoother or a relaxation method. This is a simple method like weighted Jacobi or Gauss-Seidel. And after a few iterations of a method of, of a technique like this, what happens to the underlying error is it ends up being nice and smooth, like this picture shows here. Which means what you can do is you can approximate this with a lot fewer grid points, but you can approximate it accurately. So that means you can solve for it a lot cheaper on a coarser grid. And this is called the, the coarse grid correction step. Basically, we restrict the uh, the error, the residual equations down to an, a coarser grid. You can solve for it here and make very rapid progress towards getting the answer to the problem. Now, for really large problems, this is just a fraction of that original really large problem, so this is still quite a large system. So what we do in practice is we just repeat the idea. You do relaxation again here, the underlying error gets smoother still, and you keep going to coarser and coarser grids. And we'll go down often to just a single degree of freedom, for example, or some handful, uh, very small system, solve that, and then you interpolate this error all the way back up, and this is called a V-cycle in multigrid uh, terminology. And there are lots of different uh, cycling strateg strategies, but this is one of the ones that's used most commonly, especially in parallel. So that was a geometric picture. You know, it had nice geometric grids and things like that. Often, problems come from all, all kinds of different um, places, and uh, they can be unstructured grids or, you know, something that's not even a grid-based problem. Um, so there's something called algebraic multigrid, which has a lot of the, which it has the same multigrid principles that it's built on, but it just uses the system, the linear system, or the matrix equations themselves. So there, there are no real grids in algebraic multigrid. Instead, you use the graph of the matrix to serve as your grid, and you course in the graph, and then you have to build coarse squared systems and all these kinds of things. It's uh, one of the main workhorse solvers we have in. Uh, hyper, actually. Um, it can be applied to a lot of different problems. Here's an example of its scaling. Um, it takes a lot of work and research and algorithmic changes to, to get to this point. This is a weak scaling plot of uh, our Boomer AMG solver all the way out to 1.1 million cores. So it's about 72 billion unknowns in, this, in our largest problem here. Um, 
the different lines have to do with different combinations of uh, OpenMP threads and MPI tasks. So there's one combination that didn't work very well in this particular set of one runs. But you can see it scales pretty nicely. Okay, so that's just kind of a, a quick overview of what multigrid is. Since this is more or less a tutorial, then what I'll spend a large majority of the time doing is talking about what we call conceptual linear system interfaces, because this is something different in Hyper that you don't see in, in a lot of other linear solver libraries. Okay, so how do we use Hyper in a sort of a general sense? First, you have to make a few decisions. You have to decide uh, which of these linear system interfaces you're going to use that's most natural for your problem. I'll say more about that in a second. Then you choose the solver preconditioner you want to use, and then based on that, there's an underlying matrix storage format you have to use. Once all those decisions are made, then you write your code. And writing the code involves a few high-level steps. As you might have to build some auxiliary structures. Grids and stencils is an example that I'll show. Uh, then you can build the matrix and vector, uh, uh, matrix right-hand side and all that kind of stuff for your system. Build the solver and precondition you want to use to solve the system, solve it, and then get the solution out at the end. So those are the major steps that are involved. So conceptual linear system interfaces. This is uh, something in Hyper that uh, is a little different from other packages. Often in a linear solver, the most common interface that linear solver packages use is on the top right here. Um, basically, you describe your system in terms of standard matrix terminology. Row, uh, row uh, three, column four has non-zero, you know, 3.9, something like that. And you build, a, you build a matrix like this, and then you solve it somehow. Uh, there are other ways, if your system comes from a PDE, um, like what Lori described in her talk, you might have a grid and a stencil that sort of popped out naturally from the discretization. And you could equally, you could, also, you could describe your linear system in that form if you wanted to. And if you did that over way, over, all the way on the left here, then you could actually use a multigrid method, for example, that uses the fact that you have structure in the problem. You could store it differently. You might have computational kernels that are, can take advantage of structure and be more efficient, et cetera, um, over here. But equal, you could also take this interface to describe your problem and build a, a general compressed sparse row matrix format and use something like algebraic multi, which is, a sim, which is a general solver. So we support different ways of describing the linear system so that we can get some of these benefits um, that I just described. And this goes, this lists them you can look at that later. I, I don't want, need to repeat it. OK, so in Hyper, we support currently four of these conceptual linear system interfaces. The first is a structured interface, so a logically rectangular grid problem with stencils. Um, Semi-structure is the next thing. These are the two that I'll go over a little more here. These are problems that have a lot of structure in them, but they're not entirely structured. I've shown some examples here. This is a block structured grid around this wing here. Um, or a structured adaptive mesh refinement type application, or say an overset um, grid application. We also, have, we also support the FEI, which is an interface developed at Sandia for finite elements, on generally on unstructured problems. And then finally, we also have the standard sort of linear algebraic interface for defining the systems. Okay? So let me jump into the, the, the two middle ones that I, I mentioned. Um, okay, so the first one's stru called struct. And it's appropriate for problems on structured grids or logically structured grids, and it's scalar problems. Um, it's described in terms of grids, and a grid in this interface is a, basically a collection of something called a boxes. So boxes are like these two boxes that I've shown here, a collection of grid points, and together they define a grid. And the way you so the way and the way you just you describe this to Hyper as you give the lower and the upper corner of a box, and you define any number of boxes, and the union of those is your grid. And I'll show you the example in a second. And for this particular interface, the, um, the data is always assumed to be associated with the cell center, okay? So there's four basic objects that have to be set up in this interface, a grid, a sensor, and then the matrix and vector. And let's consider a simple Laplacian problem for illustrative purposes. And we'll assume that we have this simple grid here, this simple stair-stepped grid, and a five-point uh, finite volume discretization. So the first thing you have to do is parallelize this grid. Um, so 
for this example, we'll assume that it's distributed on two processors, one, one on the left here, process zero and process one. This is just a choice I've made for illustrative purposes here. The decision about how the problem's distributed is completely up to the user. So this is just for, for this example. Okay, and we'll consider processor zero's or process zero's code. So to set up the grid, the first thing you do is call, so I'll have code down in the bottom and then I'll have a little picture up in the top left. So the first thing you do is create the grid. You give it the number of dimensions, it gives you an empty grid object. And that's what this grayed out thing in the top left represents is this empty grid object. And the next thing you do is you call this function set extents. You give it a lower and an upper bound for a box. And the box is in blue up there on the right. And then we do it again for another box. And then the very last thing you do is call assemble, okay? So at this point, process one's done a similar thing for its part of the grid and we've got a, a, a distributed grid that we've, we've constructed. It's pretty straightforward. Now we need to, to define this thing called a stencil, and here again you call create, and it, uh, you give it the size of the stencil, the number of dimensions, and it returns an empty stencil object. And then for this five-point stencil, uh, what you do is you, you describe the different parts of the stencil with, these, with offset values. So zero comma zero, when you call set element with zero zero, describes the center of the stencil. Minus one zero is the west coefficient, one zero is the east coefficient, south, and then north. Okay, and that's all you need to do here. You don't, there's no assemble routine. So that's how you set up the stencil. It, and the stencil can have any kind of pattern you like, as you can see. Okay, now with these two things, and you, now you're ready to set up the matrix and the vector. And they have similar kinds of calls. You call create to get an empty matrix back. You pass it the grid and the stencil. You have to call initialize, which says I'm ready to set coefficients. And then the way you set the coefficients is through these set box values calls. And what I've illustrated here, the first one sets a number of values up in this left box here. And I'm also trying to illustrate here that you don't have to set all of the coefficients of the stencil all in one call. You can set some, any subset you like. Uh, so here I've done the center and the south coefficient for illustrative purposes. Um, and the values themselves are in some array that you pass in through the interface as well. So we do this, and then there's some boundary conditions you have to deal with that I'll talk about on the next slide, and then finally you say assemble, and now your, your, your matrix is ready to go. So the boundary conditions are done similarly. There's supposed to be a little blue box here that shows that for these points. And what you do is you call set box values again right there um, to set the south coefficient to zero. And this is just setting up your boundary conditions along the, south, the southern part of this boundary. And you do something similar on the other boundaries. Okay, so that's the boundary condition part. Vectors are similar. You have create, initialize, and you also set box values where you, where you put the vector values in. And once, you're, once you've done all these steps that I've just described, you've got a linear system in hand that you can then use um, to pass a matrix and vector to solvers and, and solve the system, okay? Um, we also have the ability, some of the solvers support symmetric storage. To do that, all you have to do is insert one additional call between the create and the initialize for the matrix, basically saying it's symmetric and hyper will only store half of the coefficients there. So you get some storage savings and maybe some cash benefits and things like that. So that's the struct interface. The, the next interface we have uh, that I'll just talk a little bit about is called semi-struct. Um, I've already mentioned what this does. It's really a generalization of this structured interface I just talked about. Some of the things it generalizes, you can now look at more general PDE. So you, instead of just cell-centered quantities, you have uh, multiple types of quantities. You can represent cell, face, nodal, any combinations of these things. As I said, many of, the, many of the calls are also similar to the structured interface because the grids themselves are actually built out of structured, what we call parts. So you build a bunch of structured parts and then you glue them together with uh, some special, some new routines that are part of this interface. Um, and namely, the, this, is, this new object called a graph is the way we tie the different structured parts together. And there's sort of three main routines that you use to do that. There's something called graph add entries, which is a way of arbitrarily coupling data between two parts. So this is sort of an unstructured thing that you're introducing into this problem. Um, or you can take the grids themselves and through this set neighbor part or set shared part call, relate them together. And um, 
and that also is a way of tying the different structure grids apart. And I'll show quickly a couple of examples. Both of them are block structured examples. One of them uses a, a stencil approach, but then you can also do a finite element style approach for setting up the system here as well. Okay, so here's the first one. It's just a diffusion problem, so similar to a Laplacian. And I've got five structured uh, grids that are glued together in this way that's not globally Cartesian. I've got not just a cell center quantity, but I've got X face values and Y face values. So I've got different types of variables, which means I have three different stencils, one for centers, one for X face, and one for Y face. And that's an, that represents an actual discretization of that problem that, that's in the literature. So the way you might describe this is you can, the natural way is to let each of these structured grids be its own part, okay? So it, since they're each structured in, individually, and you might label them this way, zero, one, two, three, four, um, you might also decide, for, as I am in this example, to give each part to one processor. But again, this is up to the user how you distribute this. You can do it in any number of ways. And so let's consider part three or processor three's uh, calls. And I won't go through all of them. But basically what you do is for processor three, we'll say it will give the extents for this piece of the grid that it owns. And then it'll make a, a couple of calls that relate part three to part two and relate its part to part four. So it'll base, you need to also describe the relationship here between the neighboring parts, okay? And if you do that, you sort of have this picture here. Um, it's one requirement is that all the parts have to have the same list of variable types, so it has to be consistent. The other thing that happens here, you'll notice, is that a point like the one that's illustrated here um, that's a variable that live, that's a separate variable in part three and part two, but once you relate the two parts together through the set neighbor part call, hyper recognizes that, that recognizes that they're actually the same. It's not two separate variables, they're the same variable. And the other thing it, it can deal with as well is the fact that on part three, that variable is called a Y face variable, and, and on part two, it's called an X face variable. So all those complications about how these things get glued together or dealt with inside the code. The stencils, very much like what was in the structured case. The main difference here is that this, for this Y face stencil, for example, it's not only coupled to Y face variables, but also cell centers and X face variables. So you have to have an extra argument and a call to, the, to set up the stencil to tell it what the variable type is or the variable number is that you're coupling to. Otherwise, it's pretty much the same. You pass in offsets. That was all sort of a stencil-based approach to setting things up. You can also do this in a finite element way. These uh, calls in blue are the, uh, the, the additional calls that help you to do things in a finite element way. Um, and there are things like, um, you know, these, this is an optional routine for setting up the ordering of your, uh, your unknowns in the, in the element. Uh, you also have an optional, optional routine for setting the sparsity pattern of the local stiffness matrix. Um, and then the way you set the values themselves, instead of calls set box values, you use these add FEM values calls where you pass in stiffness matrices and they get assembled internally in, in hyper. So, and we have some examples here, 13, 14, 15, all sort of use this finite element style approach and you can look at that to see more detail. Here's another block structured example that's very much like the one I just showed. The main difference is here I've got nodal values and I'm going to set things up by passing in little stiffness matrices, so four by four stiffness matrices associated with this, with each of the cells, and they'll get assembled in, in, the, uh, in a finite element fashion. Uh, and as before, a natural way to split this up is into uh, six parts, and you could also give each processor a single part, and I just mentioned that we have this, the, the main difference is the way you pass in the values themselves. Instead of by stencils, you pass them in by stiffness matrices. So with the semi-structured interface, another nice thing you can do is you can change the underlying matrix storage format, um, as I sort of alluded to in the beginning, by basically adding two calls to your code. So between the create and the initialize for the matrix, you can make this set object type call and say, I want to store it as a compressed sparse row matrix. Then after the matrix is assembled, you can then get this compressed sparse row matrix out and you can call something like Boomer AMG. But you can also set up a different kind of matrix and call a different solver without having to change all of the, the complications of the actual interface 
calls for setting the, the coefficients themselves. Okay, so quickly about solvers. Uh, these are the solvers in Hyper. God, I wish this pointer worked. The, there are some that are designed for structure problems, some for semi-structured, some for general matrix situations. And these columns here show you, depending on which interface you use, what kind of access you have to the solver. So you can see the semi-structured actually gives you access to most of the solvers in Hyper. So if you've got a setting that is, has, a, has a lot of structure in it, we really recommend using that for, for, the, for that reason. Uh, setting up a solver is, is um, a lot like what I showed you. There's a create call, and then there's a, you can set a bunch of parameters. For example, you can set the tolerance for the solver, for the stopping criteria. Then there's a setup call, uh, and then a solve call to solve the system. You get the values out, and the way you get the values out is, again, using the conceptual linear system interface you use to set the problem up. And then you destroy things when you're done. Okay? Here's an example of a, a conjugate gradient method preconditioned by a structured multigrid solver. You set up the preconditioner first by um, calling create. You get a preconditioner object, setting some values. Then you set the conjugate gradient solver up by calling create, uh, setting a tolerance, for example, and then setting the preconditioner. You pass in the actual preconditioner that was constructed up here. Then you do set up and solve. That's the basic way you, you do this for preconditioned uh, conjugate gradient or other Krelov method. I mentioned SMG just now. Uh, we have SMG and PFMG are uh, multi-grid methods for solving uh, structured type problems. PFMG is more efficient in general, but uh, it's, it's not as robust as SMG. But normally, we try to point people towards PFMG. There's also constant coefficient versions of, the, of these solvers, uh, which can go a lot faster if you have a situation where the coefficients of your sensor are the same all over the grid. Um, Boomer AMG I mentioned before. This is our algebraic multi-grid solver. Um, AMS is an auxiliary space Maxwell equation solver for, so if you have electromagnetic type uh, application, this, is a, this can be a great solver for the definite Helmholtz problem. It's built on top of Boomer AMG. So all the work we've done to make Boomer AMG scale well is inherited naturally by, the, by, this, by this solver. We also have some non multi grid methods. So this is a sparse approximate inverse method. Um, for solving linear systems of equations. And we also have uh, Euclid as our uh, incomplete LU factorization method in the, in the library. OK. So a quick comment about solver parameters. Some of these solvers have lots and lots of parameters. And the choice of them can really impact performance. And there really isn't enough time here to go into details of any particular solver. But what we normally do in Hyper is try to choose defaults that work for some, some class of problems. But that choice doesn't always work for, for other classes of problems. And uh, in particular, parameters have pros and cons associated with them. So here's an example with Boomer AMG. You with Boomer AMG, you can choose the way you course in the grid, the way you define interpolation. And this choice right here, HMIS, long range interpolation and, and interpolation truncation, are nice because they reduce communication. But in the process, they also degrade convergence. So they have a pro and a con. It turns out that for diffusion type problems, the, the pros outweigh the con, and you get a, a pretty good method here. Uh, but that, you can't, these aren't going to be sort of uh, our, um, parameters that will work for all problems. So in general, I'd say don't hesitate to comp contact us through this hyper support email and ask questions and look for guidance for parameter selection. So getting the code is easy. You just go to this place to download it. You can Google it and find, find, find things pretty quickly. Uh, we have example programs that I mentioned already. Um, building the library is supposed to be pretty straightforward. You're supposed to be able to just type configure followed by make. Um, and if, if it doesn't work, there are some configure parameters that you can use to help configure uh, things so that it, it does work. There's also a CMake uh, way to build the library. And this is really ideal in a Windows environment. This install file uh, that comes with the, di with the distribution has more information about how to build it. We also support Fortran. We have a Fortran interface. We don't provide separate documentation for that. But uh, there's really a, a really nice one-to-one -one mapping between what the C code looks like and what the Fortran code looks like. They're very similar. And I mentioned hyper support. If you've got questions, 
comments, bug reports, any of these types of things, this is the best way to contact us is through this email. So Rob, I was just going to ask you that uh, scaling study, you went up to 72 billion unknowns. Where'd you get the unknown set from? Is that sort of a, a synthetic set or was that a real application? Uh, usually we do diffusion problems for the scaling studies because they're easy to build in parallel. Um, doing a scaling study for a, a complicated physics problem is a lot harder, obviously. Um, so, and it doesn't really teach you much about the scaling, frankly. So that's normally what we do for these things.